said that I didn't get singing in the rain because apparently I spelled it wrong. Yes. I saw all the movies. For once, saw the movies. We're all, all the movies. We're all back. And at least we at least you've seen Singing in the Rain before, Warner, so no one's going into this completely blind, which is which is a rarity on this show. Yeah. I think it's one of the first week people actually wanted to watch what we had assigned. <laughs> I think that was a first for a while. Well, I mean sort Since of I didn't sort of I was a little resistant to Singing in the Rain, but then I saw it again and then I was like, Holy shit, this is a lot better than I remembered it. That's the one thing I like. Like, here's the thing. Also, this Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is way better than I remembered it. Being. Same. As a me too. I had a very similar reaction. Well, I will say this: the the, the, the weakest parts of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is when is when the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is when they sing. Oh yes, absolutely. I have many grievances with the music. I have the, many the, grievances with the music, but. I don't, except for except for Cheer Up Charlie. I think that one's a little bit meh. It could be taken out, and I, and I wouldn't care. But I, but I think everyone, but I think everything else is fine. Well, I'm not saying they're bad songs. Just like those songs <laughs> are just weak parts of the movie uh, by comparison. Like when they're talking, it's genius. And then you just get the well, song. Uh, Supposedly, until the first take in every room of the factory. Nobody except Gene Wilder knew what was going to happen, and everybody's first introduction to Gene Wilder was when he comes down the steps. That was the first take of that. And, and he improvised like, doing little somersaults. <laughs> he, didn't, like, he, he, didn't, he didn't improvise that because that was in his contract. He had to be able to do that to take the part before he would take the part. Well, I mean, yeah, because I think around then he was like a, what, 36, 37-year-old man as opposed to an 80-year-old man. But but it was his idea, is the point. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was his idea, like, because I think his argument for well, was, once that. I do that, they won't know if I'm telling the truth or lying. And yes. none of them knew the talk for a, they knew they were going to be on a boat, but they didn't know what was going to actually happen in the boat scene. They basically knew nothing going into the fact Except their lives. So before, have we seen any movies recently, guys? Oh, so we're not Outside. just jumping right into Stop. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory then? Okay, well. We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Um, this My is answer's the... no. Well. So. Uh, uh, sorry. Nope. The only movie that I've watched recently is Phineas and Ferb Across the Second Dimension. <laughs> I've never seen any of the Phineas and Ferb movies. There's only one. It's, there's only there's only the one. Oh wait! It's, I mean, it's, oh wait! Oh, oh wait! So it's the unless TV you count the one-hour specials movie. as movies. I think the only thing I really saw this week was um, I just here's inspired by every frame of painting. I decided because I had to watch the general like must be for class. I decided you know I'm going to play the Grand Budapest score to this. <laughs> and God damn it, that's the best decision I've made in years. <laughs> Goes <laughs> uncommonly well with with the, with the general. And I, I I recommend all of you to do that. I will have to try it. I think I'll, I'll do I'll do I'll do Sherlock Junior next to the to um to the Grand Budapest theme. I haven't seen any Buster Keaton I'm movies. Watching Grand Budapest on Monday in my intro to film class. I think, um, here's the thing, but like, I know you, you, you're probably going to be kind of off-put because you've already been off-put by early Chaplin, but, like, Keaton's movies but... have more, have more consistent gags. Like, there are more gags in a Keaton movie than there are in a Chaplin movie. Speaking of silent films, Singing in the Rain. <laughs> Do we want to go in? I haven't even introduced the show yet, Reed. This is... <laughs> Wait. This is completely a box. Completely you did. We've been just spiraling around for the last five minutes. God damn it. Garrett is very confused because we jumped from topic to topic before I caught what the middle topic was. Look, Skype cuts off certain people's audio when another person is talking sometimes, so that oh, yeah, interferes yeah. a little bit. Fuck you, Skype. Um... <laughs> 
So this is the Hack Fraud Show. Oh, oh, John's doing the intro today. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes, I am sick of waiting for you fuckers. Well, thanks. This anyway. This is the Hack Fraud Show. We, this is Musical Week. I, I guess we so. Of uh, sorts. Yes. Sure. Well, these are both musicals, unless you think, unless you just watch Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Fact factory without the music which might be advisable but that might uh, be advisable we'll get to that um, summer of filmmakers i happen to enjoy gene wilder's here's come with me and yeah we'll, yeah a land of pure imagination yeah well, i mean i need to yeah we will no, get, we'll just fucking dive we'll into willie wonka okay gene wilder's fucking amazing. hold on a minute jesus christ <laughs> these movies. what do you mean hold on just I, go jesus okay hold on this right. is the Hack Fraud Show. Summer of Filmmakers is officially over. Before we started, I wanted to, like, just do a, a quick kind of wrap-up because we spent, like, 12 weeks on this, and I just kind of wanted to maybe have a little bit of a, a, a wrap-up of Summer of Filmmakers to kind of, I don't know, see if we learned anything at all. In Didn't we do that last week? Oh, was this... Didn't we do that last week? Well, we had a little bit, but I, I just wanted to officially kind of wrap things up as far as how that was okay. concerned. So you we want to know you want to know what each of us learned at summer camp? I sure why not? I'll give you a short answer, then a long answer. I'll start with with with, with a short answer first. What I learned in summer camp is jack shit. Now, 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 now in the long run, it basically what what I learned is that that basically going into it all the versus going out of it greatly changed how I thought about filmmakers. And a lot of them I'm a little, like, meh about. Maybe with the exception, uh, personally for me, for uh, Kaufman, Spielberg, and uh, Spike Jones. Mr. Warner, what about you? I learned that while I may like one movie from a filmmaker, I, I typically don't like all of them that we've watched. And that, apparently, I have a very controversial opinion about E.T. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, you do. And you will never live that down. But, uh, <laughs> Tyler, what did you learn from Summer of Filmmakers? I learned that there's a lot of stuff that seems to be universally beloved for reasons that we are unable to explain. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and perhaps that... Um, you shouldn't just take critical opinion at face value, but maybe maybe we knew that already. Do we respect critics less? I don't know. I still respect I, critics, I, but... I, I, I've never respected critics. I think I respect them a little less, but that's based on circumstance, though. I mean, generally, yeah, but there's some special circumstances, like MASH or whatever. I don't know. If any... I think, what did I learn from? I think if anything, I think I think I talked briefly about this yesterday. It's like I am a far, I have far more conventional taste than what I previously thought. Because <laughs> like, like when we when we look at like when we ever look like a really unique and a really unique and innovative director, we typically don't like that. Or and, and then there's other cases where there's a lot of these filmmakers are just too conventional, like a pitch pop. And if anything, like where where we tend to like directors is where like they in, is where they intersect between innovation and convention. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think I think um, oh god, well, how god is that thing? I don't know. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. If anything, that's like you have Matt Chip Kaufman on one side and you have convention, conventional Kaufman on the other, and then Eternal Sunshine is kind of right in the gap, right in the middle there. I think if anything, we just—I guess—we like balance. I suppose. <laughs> so we decided this week that we needed something to kind of uh, wash our hands of summer of filmmakers a bit, and uh, <laughs> so we decided to watch two delightful musical films, and also to to commemorate the the passing of Gene Wilder um, uh, with uh, one of his all time classic roles as Willy Wonka in. The rather bizarrely okay. named Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Which, I guess, I guess let's dive into this. 
finally. Um, we needed to learn what we did at summer camp. Like, well, this week was just like we had the wash off disappointment, and there was no disappointment to be found this week. Hooray! For once. All, all I think all we were was um, delighted and uh, for once. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Pleasantly surprised. Pleasantly surprised, yes. Yes. Just because I thought I'd like, uh, I thought I'd like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but goddamn, this movie is just so fucking delightful. See, I've never seen it all the way through. Oh. This week. Oh. So, I watched it all the way through this morning, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, God, this is a delightful movie. But God, those kids can't act! <laughs> <laughs> Some of them can. No, some of, some of the can't. Like, well, that's the thing about it. I, I describe this is a movie where an old white man... A rich old white man entertains himself by by inviting a perfect child and some stereotypes to his fuckhouse. <laughs> and it really is a fuckhouse. That's sadly accurate. So, um... Love it. In, in a, you know, in a first for this show, uh, I took some notes uh, for about my <laughs> reaction to this movie. What? This was what? something I've been meaning to do for a while, but never actually did. But I, I wanted to s- sort of organize my thoughts on on this movie. Professionalism. <laughs> we have it. We promise. Uh, but uh, so, if, may I uh, uh, go down the road of of my personal history yet again? Why, yes, you may. Well, get, criticism without personal stories is not good criticism. Okay. So, um, when I was a kid, I. Love, 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 loved, loved the book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, the the original Roald Dahl book is is just it's a delightful book. It's great. I haven't read it in a long time, but I just remember loving it when I was a kid. And it's a book that I think every kid should read. Um, it's just fantastic, right. full of uh, just wonderful like whimsical stuff, but also like weirdly sick and dark humor. <laughs> yeah, I've I've read well, about that's a. That's a monk here for uh, for Ronald Dahl. Is just like we have whimsy combined with the most fucked up shit you could ever imagine. Yes, I've I've, I've read yes. about what got cut out of the book, uh, such as a child named Herpes, um, <laughs> and anyway. But yes, I, I loved the book when I was a kid. I read it before I saw either of the movies, and I saw the 2005 Tim Burton version. Uh, first, before I saw the Willy Wonka version, which sacrilege, I I know. How did did my parents allow that to happen? Um, But I I actually quite enjoyed the Tim Burton version uh, as a kid. I haven't watched it in a long time. They do do this weird thing where they give, like, Willy Wonka an origin story, which never sat very well with me. And you get to see the origin of the Oompa Loompas... Well, that's in the book, so that's that's okay. Was that, well, no, like he talks about it, but does would they actually show that? Yeah, they show a little bit of it. Yeah. It's a little weird. I don't know. N- neither of these movies are are perfect. Um, but anyway, when when I first saw the this version, the '70s version with Gene Wilder, my reaction was basically Gene Wilder's a much better Willy Wonka, but on the whole, uh, this movie has it completely wrong. Like this movie just is not. This is what I thought at the time. I thought the yeah. movie this, that this movie was just not in tune with the spirit of the book at all. Because going into it, first of all, I didn't know it was a musical, so <laughs> that was a bit of a problem. <laughs> and also, um, I just I don't know. I was just not prepared for what that movie entailed exactly. So. Having now watched it again with uh, modulated expectations, because everyone acts like this is just one of the greatest movies of all time, um, or just like a, a perfect kids movie, which maybe it is, but we'll come back to that in a minute. But having rewatched it now, it was far better than I remembered and far better than I thought initially. It's delightful. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, Roald Dahl has sole screenplay credit on this movie. Um, which I don't believe for a second. It was obviously rewritten without him, but, and there's no way he would have made, uh, approved of, of the songs that were put in this thing. But there is a lot of stuff in this movie that is, is very dull, especially in the first half. There's a lot of stuff that oh, yeah. feels very in tune with his sense of humor. 
I kind of have a similar personal history. It's like, I read the book before seeing any of the movies. And I think I saw the older one first. And then, and then of course, then I saw the 2005 one. And I think I, I have a similar reaction. I like the 2005 one purely because it's 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 simply more, at least on a surface level, more faithful to, to the book. Yeah. And I just thought I just thought the Willy Wonka one was just like it was just strange and bizarre and out of left field in places it didn't need to be. But now I think I sort of I think I watching it this time I realize all of the satir even 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 beyond the obvious there was a lot of satire with this there was a lot of just poking poking fun at society at large like there's you you poke fun at the media because all they talk about <laughs> is these fucking golden tickets yeah oh yeah. Uh, you make fun of consumerist culture when you there's like the scene where the woman, her husband has been taken hostage and she has to give up get him back and she just says, "Can I think about it?" <laughs> yes, all all of that stuff feels very much um, of a piece with with Roald Dahl and with the book, which is great. Um, but let's get to the the man of the movie, shall we say? Um, Mr. Willy Wonka, as played by Gene Wilder. Um, great. Much better than Johnny Depp's borderline sociopath, but, um... I think that's rather obvious. Like, this is a very I, difficult I personally part. Very, and I very much enjoy Johnny Depp's line when talking about how every, almost everything in that room is edible. He says, including me, but that's called cannibalism. That's not allowed. Or, and that's frowned <laughs> I really like that. Except, well, I mean, yeah, but that's more of a Tim Burton type of twist, which I can accept. But I do think the cannibalism it. line is in the book, but I, I'm not. I'm not completely sure about that. I know. The, well, the thing about like this is kind of a difficult part because it's kind of a difficult character to get a grasp of. Yeah. And the, and you come to, and you when you come to like how do I play this? And Gene Wilder is both apathetic, over the top. Subtle, even subtle at times. It is just this, this grand spectrum of a performance that is always thoroughly entertaining. Well, I think he hits pretty much exactly the right note of that. Like, this is a guy who who just acts very crazy and very strange. But you know, there's there is a very like a kindly and somewhat world weary man underneath, and he yeah. brings that out very very well. Yes. Yeah. He is not a man without morals or without a, a sort of internal logic. Yes, he just doesn't have patience oh, for stupid no, people. <laughs> no. Like, when was the book written? Uh, the the sixties, I think. Nineteen sixty four. Four. Yeah. Sixty. Because there's this weird sort of subtext of this movie that I don't quite remember from the book, but it's been a while, so I might be wrong. But you have all this doll whim, all of this doll whimsy of the chocolate factory and the Gene and and Gene Wilder, Willy Wonka, and all this wonderful Technicolor appearances. But then you just have all these like cynical '70s parents going, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> Wonka, you're absolutely mad. Yeah. And, and I adore, and I adore that. Like, there's there is quite a lot of comedy that just gets with, "You're off your bleeding knob, Wonka." <laughs> A lot of the humor does come from from the adults' kind of reaction to to the factory and to Wonka's mm -hmm. antics, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I enjoy this movie much more on on this go round. I think actually it might be a little it might be better structured than the book, quite frankly, because like the book the book just kind of ends like mm -hmm. like all the all the children like disappear except for Charlie and then. Just Charlie's left, so Wonka's like, "Oh, you're the only one left! Hooray, you won!" Um, <laughs> Except it's a little bit more complicated because you're the only one cause... who didn't fuck up, and um, yeah. and then they just kind of they go and pick up Charlie's family, and like that's the end of the book. Um, the movie adds this, um, this little this kind of final turn where Charlie kind of has to prove himself and and prove his his um his kindness to Wonka, which I think actually works very very well. And then you kind of see yes, Wonka not, actually not, open up for the first time, which is great. Yeah, it's a sort of plot where they have to, he has to, okay, he's proved he's not stupid, but is he yeah. actually a person? Yes. Because like, that's, because that's like, the kids are all, are all, the other kids are all just idiots. And right. like Charlie, just by proxy of not doing something stupid, gets through it all. Yeah. 
And so, and that's just the final, like, well, you've made it this far, or do you actually deserve? Do you actually deserve what you're right. what you're being did? Which is why I think that maybe this movie does does the ending better than the book because, like. Yes, he does actually have to do something. He is. He doesn't just. He isn't just not stupid. He's actually a good yeah. person. Yes. It's a nice button. Yes. One thing I I did um, have a bit of a problem with um, the whole uh, fizzy lifting drinks thing with with Charlie yeah. and Grandpa Joe. It's like okay. Mm-hmm. I thought, like, Charlie wasn't this stupid. Like, why would they do this? It doesn't really make sense. And I. I think I know why they did it. I think it's, like, one of two reasons. Like, maybe both. Two, one, I think, would be to, like, make Charlie more relatable so he's just not, like, this perfect child, which I guess makes sense. And also to kind of set up this final plot turn where, like, Wonka gets all pissed off and, like, Charlie has to kind of prove himself. Now, both of those That's things... Unnecessary. Yeah, both of those things are good in theory, and I get you You have to set up that final thing somehow, but I think that there was a better way to do it than have Charlie do basically, like, the same thing that the other kids do, which is just do something that Wonka tells them not to do, and just get out well, of it instead. Well, um, for Charlie, it was more... His grandfather talked him into it. Yeah, but he shows no protest either. Well, I mean, Charlie. Well, I mean, Charlie's grandfather had, had, hadn't been out of bed in twenty years, so so you think I Charlie's going to say, "Hey, don't do that." Logic aside, that's just a weird cul-de-sac of a plot point because, yeah. like, they, you set that up at the end, but they spend almost no time on it. It could very easily have been cut out. Like, you could have easily just had, like, just the plot point is, will uh, Charlie return the gobstopper? But after I, Wonka has just ignored them. I feel like you need to give Wonka a reason to kind of, like, send them away, which I'm trying to think of a better way to do that. I'm sure there is one, but... It's... It's... I don't know, I, I think the gobstopper... I think I think that well, no, the, the Gobstopper thing works very very well, but I think just yes. like not returning it, I don't know if that's quite enough to kind of be a catalyst for that final push to the end. I, I don't know. I did feel I did feel like that was kind of spont- a, 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 a bit spontaneous, and that there wasn't enough to sort of push it to justify, like sort of that payoff was like yeah okay, but like Wonka's reaction. With that, I think, is a little too much. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's an excuse bit. just to have Gene Wilder go off the chain for a couple of minutes and open up a half safe. See, I... No. I, I, I really do think that, like, they were trying to kind of, like, put Charlie in a position where he actually, like, had to kind of atone for his actions and do something to, to, to prove his goodness to, to Wonka. And... I don't know... It, the, the fizzy lifting drinks thing works well enough. There's probably a better way to do it, but I can't think of one, so I guess I am no in no position to, to criticize. <sighs> and maybe, maybe it was just like a no-win situation. Like, they decided, like, we're going to put this really nice ending. Shit, how do we earn it? Um, fizzy lifting drinks, okay. <laughs> so I think, but, but here's the thing about it. I, despite that, this script's gold. <laughs> This script is good. I think this script, this script is just so cool and just so funny and just so rich. I, I just love every second of this movie, to be honest. I, th- I think every part of this movie has something creative, something really funny, something satirical in it. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's delightful. Gene Wilder is amazing. And, yeah. It's, he's, he's, basic, he's basically a Jack Nicholson Joker that makes candy for a living. <laughs> And employs small orange Oompa-loompas. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it really I mean, works. Well, there's also, like, a really... It's kind of weird because, like, it's it's this really whimsy, dull universe, but it's all shot kind of like 70s New Hollywood, which is kind of weird and also really is it? funny. It's really more like kind of a 60s Hollywood musical, quite, in my it, opinion. It kind, of, it, it kind of looks like Sitting in the Rain. To be I honest, yeah, kind of does. songs, they just cut to like word, black images, and words. Oh, okay, well, <sighs> oh, that's a little. I know, like, this but... is like a seventies pop art vibe to it that I actually I think is really unique and funny. 
Okay, well, all right, let, let, let's just address the elephant in the room. Yes, movie's delightful. Movie's a lot of fun. Why is it a musical? Most of yeah, the songs yeah. in this thing suck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a musical because they wa- they were bringing in Gene Wilder and they wanted him to sing. But Gene Wilder, Gene Wilder wasn't a known for singer. his singing. <laughs> He's not that good of a singer. But also, in defense, though, some of the songs in Singing in, Sing in the Rain aren't good, and I'll get to that. We'll get there. But none of the songs in none of the songs in Singing in the Rain are aggressively terrible, which Cheer Up Charlie we'll is. Yeah, yes, yes, but I do think that there are a couple exceptions in Singing in the Rain. I don't know. Look. I really like in a world of imagination. Oh, yes, there's uh, one. Yes. There's exactly yes. one good song in this, which is pure imagination. But even that song doesn't really belong in this movie. Like, I don't think Willy Wonka, as a character, would would sing a song like that. No, yeah, that, he kind of goes into overt uh, sentimentality, which is not really his character. Mm. And I, I don't know. There's something. I guess maybe it's a case like, hey, it's a kids movie. Yeah, it's this whimsy world. Maybe we just gotta make. Maybe it's like it's the Disney vibe of well, it has to be a musical. I, I don't. I really don't know why it's a musical. And and I, I I completely agree. Like the songs in this movie are by far the weakest part of it. Like that's when the that's when just thing the pacing just hits the ground and everything just stops is when they stop. Oh. To, I can say. Although the pacing in this movie is, unlike the timeline, it's pretty weird because I think right when they get to the chocolate room, it's more than halfway through the movie. I, it, this movie moves I pretty fast, out. though. Well, I guess, oh, this movie flies by. It, it's a, yeah. it moves along at a pretty brisk clip. But, I don't know. The, the Oompa Loompa songs, I think, are kind of the thing that everyone remembers. Those are fun, yeah. but... Okay, the Oompa Loompa songs in the book are hysterical. Doll's lyrics to them are just so dark and so funny, and the Burton version like retains his lyrics with good reason. And I don't know, they I feel like that was that was a lost opportunity, but yeah, whatever. It, it, those songs are strangely soapboxy and sanitized yes. in a movie that's yes. not really like that for most of it. Definitely, I don't. Well, that's the thing, like, those songs are what, they're, they're what you remember, and they, I think that's why we, I think we expected a movie that we just, that was, we expected something from this movie that it just isn't, and I think that's because we remember the songs and just how, like, just cheesy and divertive they are. Yeah. I don't know, t- take out the songs, I think this movie would work, like, almost perfectly. Yeah, I don't think you'd lose anything, honestly. And I, I think... It'd be shorter. Yeah, that's, when, when people are just talking... This script is amazing. This, it's at just like this brilliant pace. It's really funny. It's really satirical. It's, it's, just, un, it's just unbelievably entertaining. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So like, I, I don't, I don't think the songs. Were, I don't think so either. They don't ruin it. They just, I, I, they just don't need to be there. I, I, I think they're as pointless. I, I don't, I just don't think any of them are aggressively terrible. <laughs> I, I don't. Maybe, maybe Cheer, Cheer Charlie Charlie's is kind of the most out of place, but even then, Cheer, yeah. Cheer Up Charlie is the one that is most like aggress- aggressively awful. As a movie, it's great. As a musical, <laughs> mm-hmm. but hey, you know, still a lot of fun. And yeah, I like I say, I've I guess I've really gained a new appreciation for this movie. Part of me wants to go back and read the book again just to see how it holds up now. Um, yeah, I'm the book too now. The because the way I remember it, like the book is just kind of the the best of both worlds, where it has this great version of Wonka that is very much in line with what Gene Wilder did, and but it also has the kind of and the the whimsy and the darkness that I think Burton was very good at. Um, so the book is just kind of the the best of both worlds in between this. Uh, too long, don't read. The book is better, but this movie's still fun. <laughs> I don't know, like, it, I guess this, I think, I think maybe your complaints were, like, the best part of this movie is the Gene Wilder Willy Wonka. Yeah. But he doesn't show up until a good, what, when, when does he show up? Is, is that about halfway through. About halfway through. That's what I'm thinking. So, I like, think for it's half at least the movie, you don't minutes. see the best part of it. But, well, 
I don't know. I really enjoy the parts before he comes in, though, all the same. Like, the all this stuff, like, once the contest gets going with, like, the, the media circus and all the crazy stuff that happens, I think that was all a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Weirdly, the movie almost slows down when they get to the factory, even though Gene Wilder is just such a delightful screen presence. Yeah. Well, I think it's also like that is really well. Also, the beginning of the movie is like really fluent with time. Like they just keep on going; they're just moving on to new topic, the to new topic. Mm. I think like the only slow part I think is like when they sing "Good uh, Cheer Up Charlie." So yeah. So I think we we do we have any uh, other final thoughts on Willy Wonka and the Charlie Tro- and the Ch- I mean the location where they filmed it was great because I shot it in Munich. In Munich, yes, we know this. Uh, Which was I noticed that. Yeah. Well, there's also the um, there there. Well, there's a shot of the reporter reporting on Walk Bars, mm-hmm. and with the cathedral in the background, it's like, yep, that's Berlin. And you mean Munich? Munich. Sorry. Whoops. I did a Germanic slip as opposed to Freudian slip because Ford because Ford was off, was Austrian. Anyways. I, I, I recognize that immediately because I've been to Munich. But oh, goody! Uh, so, so, I, yeah, I, yeah, I really highly recommend this movie. I think this movie is maybe better than its reputation. This is one of my favorite movies. It has a it say. has a very it has a lot of hype around it. So I don't know if I would say it's better than its reputation. But I, from here on out, I I resolve to stop berating this movie. <laughs> okay. Other other than the music. Warner, do you have anything at all? I've said pretty much everything. <clears throat> everything I can say about the movie. It's delightful. I, I love it. Um, only thing I change is the soda, or the floating soda. See, but you guys already discussed all of that, so. Let's move along to Singing in the Rain. Can I start, actually? Sure. Go right ahead, Reed. Okay, so my personal history is that I... This was, I think, when I was like 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old, I saw this in band class at like 9 in the morning or something like that. And and our music teacher showed us this, Tyler can reference, yeah. and I, I, I still don't know why that happened, but I remember just watching it and not liking it, even though I don't remember we finished it. So, we did not finish it. It was it was years before I saw the end of this movie. Right, and years being uh, earlier this morning. Anyways, so 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 when I actually saw the ending, the thing I thought to myself was, Jesus Christ, this this ending's beautiful. <laughs> this is one of the best endings to a story I've seen in a long time, which I suppose makes up for the for some of the flaws in the, in uh, earlier. Which mainly in what it's mainly because of one particular song that physically repulses me. What I'm gonna say this is this a perfect musical? I think it might be because I think it might be uh, somehow none of the songs maybe. are really like organic, but that's only because like what plot there is is based around opportunities to get Gene Wilder or not Gene Wilder Gene it's Kelly to to sing and dance. Wrong Gene. As much as he wants. It's the tale of two genes, <laughs> not not two gene lovers. And and goddamn it, like I think, how long has it been since we've had a comedy that is both really funny but also just really impressive? The musical numbers in this movie are really impressive. Mm-hmm. Except for one. Which one is that? Read beautiful girls. <laughs> okay, yes, I, that is the one song I would yeah. take out. Oh. I, I mean, granted, it doesn't really have anything to do with the rest, only that monumental, as opposed to, I don't know, Paramount Studios, um, was testing out talking pictures and following and and Warner Brothers to a jazz singer, sure, but just the way, just how it was sung, just how it was choreographed, it kind of made me sick to my stomach just watching it. (laughs) I I don't remember that one, but it's been a while, so... To kind of go right off of that, I'm kind of surprised just how good this movie's commentary on the transition from the silent age to the sound age is. Yeah. Like, it is it's quite good. It's honestly a really good movie about the transition from silent silent films to the sound. Oh, I was not expecting that. I don't know. It's, it's interesting because, you know, like I say, like, the songs are kind of like, they just kind of happen. 
and they like and they take up like a a good chunk of the running time but you know you just roll with it like the, this is the way to make musicals just do the musical numbers and make them just as upbeat and and fun as you can or well not necessarily upbeat but just make them you know, just commit to them, which is something that modern Hollywood musicals, for some reason, just are unable to do. I mean, especially, like, the last couple numbers, especially, like, the modern Broadway speakeasy musical <laughs> scene. That sequence... Which I thought was brilliant. I timed it. That sequence is more than 15 minutes long. <laughs> it's, it's long, but you just go with it. Oh, yes, that absolutely. The plot is flimsy, but these characters feel real. Yeah. Like, all these, all these, and all these actors are just putting their fucking all into every frame. And they're like, every reaction, every, every single move, every single beat is just perfect. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, which should be none of you, because everyone should see this movie, but... Uh, this this movie deals with Gene Kelly plays this uh, silent film star named Don Lockwood who is has to contend with the the transition of Hollywood from from silent films to talkies, and uh, there's a lot of great references to the jazz singer. Um, yep. Uh, does doesn't it talk about um, how damn it Warner Brothers is beating us to this? We got to do this. Was it Warner Brothers? Yeah. It talks about one of the studios, and I thought it was Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah, Warner Brothers cut out the jazz singer. It is. It's in the jazz singer, the first sound film. Yes. Yes. Talking picture. Yes. And um, so the the whole movie is kind of built around this, uh, like, 1920s Hollywood and um, the kind of their their and move the, into, into sound. The female star from the silent era. Her, her voice is not cut out for talking. <laughs> and it's no. they, they won't even let her speak in public. It's it's that bad. Yeah, it's it's. I think that's a lovely plot point. Yes, um, and, and then also I think it's lovely that she has a bit of a dark side where she's selfish and yes, and, and using her faux voice throughout the rest of her career. Which I thought she's was actually nice. Lena is a a strangely three dimensional female character, especially yeah. considering like. She, the one joke of her is that her voice; she has a very shrill voice. Yeah. I know there, there's something kind of precedent is like, yes, yeah, so, she is not going to be able to go into the sound age, and she is going to bring everyone down. With her. <laughs> That's you know what? That's a normal reaction for someone like that. Yeah, like she actually she you she has like real anxieties and fears about about mm-hmm. being left behind, and mm-hmm. that's and actually that's a real concern. strangely poignant. Um, yeah. But uh, let's just, you know, this movie is delightful. It's just so much fun to watch. The The musical numbers are just fantastic. It's alumni Gene Kelly is just so fucking boring. <laughs> I didn't like that. There is a beautiful there's, person. There is such an energy to every one of the performances of this movie that it's, it's almost, it's infectious, this movie. Like any any time they, sit, they get to song and dance, you, you're just right there with them. You want to leap out of the chair and join them. This, especially several of the tap dancing. Yes. Oh, yeah. The tap dancing is yeah. so much fun. There's a, there's a wonderful physicality to everything. Like, there's, yeah. there's like a real sense, like, you, there's a real sense of what I am doing is, is labor intensive. <laughs> if they make it all look so effortless. Tap dancing is beautiful. I love it. I wish I could do that, but I'm incompetent. (laughs) (laughs) You know what's interesting about this movie, actually, is that most of the songs in the movie were were not written for this movie. Like, someone had the idea to just kind of build a musical out of a bunch of, like, older songs that, that MGM had the rights to and just kind of work them into this movie. But the script... So yeah, well. the script is so well done, and the the musical yeah. numbers like they might seem out of place, but they don't feel out of place. No, no. Like I, I guess you could like take this movie plot point by plot point and go, and eh, that's out of nowhere. That has nothing to do. But goddamn it, there's such an energy to to how it's how it's directed, the acting, the sort of the pace of everything. And it is a great story, I think. Like just kind of this yeah. this old the this star who has to contend with with this new thing and and mm-hmm. kind of move into it. And you know, I love that. Like he finds a place for himself with with musicals, which is something that he just never thought he could do before. And yeah. that's wonderful. 
it's the opening up of a character. It's like a, it's a genuinely three dimensional portrayal of the transition from silent films to sound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like they, they show, and you have like the director who's like tearing his hair out because he, they, he can't get his actors to, to talk into the mic. You have the you have that failed screening where the sounds all off, which is hilarious. Okay, yes. I, I'm, be honest, I know this is a top, or this is supposed to be portraying the time when it was transitioning, but the incompetence with the tech equipment makes me cringe every time I watch this. Which is the point. Which is what I think that's all I think it's all hilarious. They just have it's sound is new, they just have no idea what they're doing. Yes. And like it, well, granted, like here's like the, the, the what you were saying about how like oh this is all made from old MGM songs they had the rights to. Yeah. That's that's the final movie they make. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's just yeah. we have some nice uh, musical numbers. Let's just uh, stitch it, stitch it together with some flimsy plot. And yet, the script has no right to work as well as it does, and yet it totally does. Yeah, this it's it's really funny. Like this, this movie is really really funny. Yeah, absolutely. And like also, Cosmo yeah. Brown gets in some 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 great one liners. Yeah, he's one of the funniest characters I think I've ever seen on screen. Like that performance is just so energetic oh my god he's hilarious he's a riot anytime he's on screen they, they're leading it's bad we have too many positive thoughts about the movie men. oh the, the two leading men were phenomenal yeah and they were they met so well do we have anything negative to say about this movie i mean be, uh, the beautiful girl song maybe <laughs> it's not that bad is it if anything, it's just it's the only thing you can really say about it is maybe it's unnecessary. Yeah, it's probably the the most. It's the only song that maybe feels out of place. Mm-hmm. Like I say, it's the one that one song that I would probably take out, but it's still well, maybe yeah. out of a uh, a what hundred and five minute movie. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, this movie is like it's not like you know a big. Technicolor extravaganza, two and a half hour fiddler on the roof no, it's type not deal. Epic. It's it's you know it's it's intimate. It's small. The characters are great. The performances are great. Um, just this movie deserves it's all the praise that's heaped upon it. It's yeah, I, the perfect musical. It, it, it's it's really it's really wonderful. And um, I, I'm excited John, to would it be that it's a perfect musical considering you hate musicals <laughs> typically. It took Pittsburgh's own Gene Kelly. <laughs> I'm, and, it was the only way this could yes. have been done. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, Damien Chazelle uh, try and emulate it in, with La La Land. La La Land, La La Land looks... I'm, well, that's not like, there's something kind of like this movie could have... Singing in the Rain could have only been made when it was made. Mm. Because, like, cause like, then, like, almost years later, Hello, Dolly came out and flopped horribly, and that kind of killed this kind of musical forever. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm really curious what La La Land's going to turn out like. I'm, I'm excited about it. I think that the time is I, right to reinvigorate yes. things with, with an old-fashioned kind of musical. I think, mm-hmm. based on what I've read about it so far, he understood that the, the way to do a, a musical that felt modern was to do one that was very, very traditional. Mm-hmm. Strange enough. But, yes, yes, oddly enough. Um, but also, all we can do is, is wait for the for the inevitable film adaptation of Hamilton. So, <laughs> yeah, and we and we'll have a whole section of the internet bitching about it for ten years. Yeah, as uh, these things typically turn out. So we had a surprisingly good time this week. Well, maybe not that surprising. Yeah. We were we were hoping to have a, a good time this week. Well, that's the problem. Anytime we have, like, yeah, we're going to have fun this week, typically it turns out we're miserable again. <laughs> that's, like, that's, how, that's how this happens. That's how these things always go. Um, so, are we going to have a show next week? Are we going to... Oh, shit, the line thing. Um, wait, have, wait, have it. Why wouldn't we have a show? John wanted to take a break, but I don't know. Take a break. I know we can do one more. Yeah, like what? Well, because wasn't the plan like we were going to do two more, two more episodes and then take a break? I think we should do 
one or two more episodes before the break. Well, what, well, what would we do for next week? Well, um, based, based on what I, we were talking I, about I, earlier, I based on what we were... I, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Based on what we were talking about earlier, I think that this might be an apt time to do that animated series episode we were always talking about. The animated series episode. Also, animated. that would oh. that would not be a big time commitment, either. Oh. Isn't is that the one where we watch an episode or two of like three different animated series? Yeah. Okay. If this, this is the, if, if, if this is the last ep- if this is the last episode before like a two week break or something, then I'm okay with it. What are we going to be watching, guys? Well, we have to watch Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> That's. Oh, oh. That specter has just been hanging over the podcast for so long. But what of Phineas? Well, here's the thing. I There are so many episodes that I would love to watch. I... Give me a minute here. You know what I kind of want to make? I want, I want, here's the thing about it. I kind of want to make... I want to finally shove Spongebob into Tyler's face. <gasps> I thought you were going to make us yes. watch The Animaniacs. Yes. 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 Again, and it's been a while since I've seen any SpongeBob, so that might be. Although some of some of my college friends have already been shoving SpongeBob in my face. Oh, um, what, what have you seen? Uh, what have I seen? I don't know. I saw the the Fry Cook games. Uh, I saw the the Flying Dutchman episode again. Um, Shanghai. Yeah. Was that the one with the perfume department? Yes. I, I, classic ones. Uh, the camping episode. Spongebob. Gary takes a bath. There's the campfire. I, lo- I always loved the campfire episode, Best of Kid. John, I always thought you were going to use this as an opportunity to make us watch the Animaniacs. Well, the problem with that is that Animaniacs is made up of... Sh- it, it's Those episodes are a series of shorts. Of, it's three shorts stitched together an episode. And I just really don't know how to condense that show for a podcast to watch for the podcast. Unless unless you just go off and like just what would I make you I, I just don't know what I'd make you people watch. That's the issue. Because that show was just such a ram shackle. Mm. It really is. It, it's just such a I could I could I but, could make you watch like the two deaf related shorts, like the one where they go to hell and they want and the one they goof on the seventh seal. <laughs> Which I think that that's like the only thing I can think of is like yeah, what it's like I, I really I just really don't know how to introduce you guys to that show properly. At least um, unless I just like here you go, just watch it. Later. I don't. All right. Well, I think there's one. There's a couple episodes I can I can have you guys watch here. You may want to write these down. <laughs> I am going to do that. Okay. So the first one. So there's, there's, it's like Spongebob, there's two 11-minute segments per episode, with some 22-minute things. Um, so the f- one, one that you should see, uh, this is an all-time classic, um, one of the best ones they ever did, it's called Thaddeus and Thor and Deplane <laughs> Deplane. That is a fantastic choice. Deplane Deplane? What? De plain, de plain. De e, de e. Yes. These are two, and these are the two episodes you want us to watch. Those are the that, no. Those are the two segments in one. Just search oh. like Thaddeus and Thor, and you should find it. You should find it's the whole thing. You have. Yes, that is true. Yeah. It's one. it's season two, episode eight. Oh, okay. Yes, I know which one you should watch. Um, the Chronicles of Meep. That's a two-part, 22-minute episode. Oh, You're not gonna make oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I don't know what you're talking about. What, and what episode is that? Uh, that is season two, episode... Twelve? Seven. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> They had just oh, had a, they just they just had an amazing run in in the middle of season two. It was like where just they were just cranking out all time classics. So, 
I guess that'll do it. I think that's good enough. Just those two. Here, how about we do Rock Bottom? I've seen Let's Rock. Camping, I've seen Rock Let's Bottom. Episode. I've seen Rock Bottom multiple times. Okay. Do we want to do the campfire song? I haven't well, seen that let's one. Let's do that. So let Let's also do an, an episode that's that is cup that's coupled with Shanghai called Gary Takes a Bath. Oh, I've seen that one. Okay. All Chocolate right. with nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Is that the one with 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 the I remember when they first invented chocolate? Yes. Yeah. All right, I'll have to see that one. So 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 we're going to do SpongeBob. We're going to do Campfire Song. Well, it's they, called the, it, it, I mean, it's called the camping episode, if I remember right. It's probably their last. What's good what's one. the actual name of that episode? I think it's called they, Campfire Song Song. No, it's the, it's it's called the camping episode. Okay. Is that actually, what it's called. Mm-hmm. Warner, do you have any other recommendations? Well, all of my recommendations so far have kind of been poo-pooed, so. <laughs> yes, it, John. What? It, John, it is actually called the camping episode. Okay, okay. So, alrighty. So, yeah, those should be, if I am, if I remember correctly, both of those are genius. Yes. Granted, I was probably 10 last time I saw those. So, I think I, I'm, I'm, I think I was 14 or 15, but. Oh, no, I, I, I think I think I'm at least I am pretty certain about the chocolate chocolate nuts. So that's so that's musical week. Yeah, I guess that's that's it. Hello. Hello. John, the sound of the rain is coming through very strongly on your audio. <laughs> oh, sounds <laughs> Out of the room. No, I think no, I think that's Reed's. I can't, wait, can't that wait, wait, hold on. Let's seek out the solution. Why is your guys' air conditioning so fucking loud? Wait, where'd John go? John's still here. Oh, okay, okay, we need some light. He's just in the dark. Better? I, I no. guess. Okay. Can you see my dark mug? Yes, I can. Okay, how's this? Not much better, but I, we'll roll with it. That's her, but... Yeah. Uh, that's, that's right. what doing. Fuck, fuck, piss, piss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't need to... Yeah. We don't need to remember that the Dark Ages, John. <laughs> what Dark Ages? Two weeks ago. The Dark yeah. Ages of Tyler's home Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, uh, where did I leave off? Son of a... What? Oh, sorry, it froze. I yeah, everything froze. Besides which, we paid money to see Sausage Fest, so <laughs> it all balances out. Is there another platform we can do this on? You mean besides Skype? Besides Skype, we can just conference call, I guess. But that might be disastrous. 